Greetings to another DLUMC worship, online worship. I know many of you are joining us again and again and again. It's awesome. Thank you. But I have a feeling that a few of you, it's your first time joining us, and welcome to our online worship. You know, the cool part is you might be joining us Sunday morning, or maybe it's a Tuesday evening, Thursday morning, Saturday afternoon. Whenever you join this online worship, welcome. And a special welcome to someone special to me who's celebrating her birthday this Sunday morning. Happy birthday. Let us begin our worship and let God be there to guide us this week and through this worship, and like I said, through this week, in all the things we do. now our call to worship. We praise your name, O gracious and wonderful God. Great is the Lord and worthy to be praised. We praise your works and proclaim your awesome deeds. Great is the Lord and worthy to be praised. We celebrate your goodness. We sing of your righteousness. Great is the Lord and worthy to be praised. Amen. And please join me in our opening prayer. O oh God, we have gathered to give you honor and praise. We celebrate the gift of this holy day. We pray that you would draw us to you in this time of worship so that your presence might strengthen us for the journey ahead. Speak to our hearts and minds by inspiring us with your words of grace and love. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Story for All Ages. Bread and Jam for Francis by Russell Holbin. One of my, again, one of my favorite stories. You're, you're used to me and my favorite stories. I, I'm not going to read the whole story, but just a little share, share little parts of it. A lovely story of a little family, and it happens to be breakfast time. It was breakfast time, and everyone was at the table. Father was eating his eggs, and mother was eating her eggs. Gloria was sitting in her high chair and eating her eggs, too. Francis was eating bread and jam. If there is one thing I am fond of for breakfast, said father, it is soft-boiled eggs. Yes, said mother. I do love soft-boiled eggs. Ah, said Gloria, and she ate them all up. But Francis did not eat her eggs. She sang a little song to it. The, sing, the song she sang went like this. I do not like the way you slide. I do not like your soft inside. 
I do not like lots of ways, and I do for many, I can do for many days without eggs. Well, as the story goes on, you know, the family eats all kinds of foods. But of course, what does Francis eat? Bread and jam for breakfast, for lunch, for supper. She goes off to school, and what she has for lunch is bread and jam. She sees many people eating many different things. Finally, after many, many days at the supper table, they're having spaghetti, which happens to be one of my favorite foods. And this is how the story continues. That evening for dinner, mother cooked spaghetti and meatballs with tomato sauce. I'm glad to see there will be enough for a second helping, said father, because spaghetti and meatballs is one of my favorite dishes. Spaghetti and meatballs is a favorite with everybody, said mother. Try a little spaghetti, Gloria. Hmm, Gloria said, and she tried her spaghetti. Frances looked down at her plate and saw that there was no spaghetti or meatballs. There was a slice of bread and jam. Frances began to cry. Oh my goodness, said mother. Frances is crying. Whatever is the matter, asked father. Frances looked down at her plate and sang a sad song. She sang so softly that mother and father could scarcely hear her. What am I is tired of jam. I want spaghetti and meatballs, said Francis. May I please have some? Oh, I had no idea you liked spaghetti and meatballs, said mother. How do you know what I like if you don't even let me try? Francis said, wiping her eyes. So mother gave Francis spaghetti and meatballs, and she ate it all up. The story finishes where Francis tries many new things. I love the story. It reminded me of us here at church. We are trying many, many new things, and we'll continue to try many, many new things. Francis, thank you for reminding me of this. Bread and Jam by Francis by Russell Holbin. Blessings.
This morning we are going to be turning to another of our strange and wonderful Bible stories. And this one you may not have been told about as a child. Um, it comes to us from Exodus 1, 15 through 22. Listen uh, as I read from um, the NRSV version of Scripture. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shipra and the other Pua, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and they give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all of his people, Every boy that is born to the Hebrews, you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. Here ends the reading from God's holy word. Would you pray with me? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of these, your children, be found this day acceptable in your sight, O Lord, for truly you are the rock and the redeemer. Amen. What if I were to say to you that what you did this week could change the world. Would you believe me? Imagine it so. Smile politely but um, secretly scoff. Let me broaden that same question just a bit. What if I suggested to you that you do exactly that? Change the world this week. Would you believe me or doubt me? Stand taller with hope or soon think of something else, anything else? Let me stretch your imagination even further. What if I were to suggest that through each one of you, the change that you brought to the world would ripple out, affecting countless lives? In recent weeks, we have been exploring Bible passages that are strange and wonderful. Today's story is one that I imagine your parents didn't tell you about. It is the story of two women long ago in Egypt. Their names were Shipra and Pua, and when I preached from this text a century or two ago at Jamestown First United Methodist, a little boy came out and said it was a neat sermon about shipwreck and Pooh Bear. But these are no comic book characters. They were courageous Hebrew midwives, and just like midwives today, they made a decision, they took a chance, and they changed the world. And because of their act of disobedience, God was able to rescue Israel from oppression. The scripture remember their names, Shipra and Pua, but interestingly, it doesn't remember Pharaoh's name. Pharaoh isn't a name, it's a title. And he was simply Pharaoh. And yet precious ink and papyrus were spent recording the names of two midwives, Shipra and Pua. So beloved were they. Now often we think of women, particularly women who serve others in times of need, as humble. And maybe that's where Pharaoh went wrong because these two women were not humble. They were daughters of cunning. Let's delve into what has been called the midwife's tale and what has been called by Gary and I, the daughters of cunning. The deception starts on an ominous note. A ruler wanting to solidify his political base identified an enemy, a scapegoat, if you will, and blamed all the problems that currently plagued his country upon them. The ruler was Pharaoh who knew not Joseph, nor what he had done for Egypt. He also did not know God who had sent Joseph to Egypt so that Joseph might preserve a remnant of his family during times of, of famine and keep alive a remnant of God's people on earth. But Pharaoh denied the essential humanity of the Jews, viewing them only as a source of labor and generally as a problem to be dealt with. 
The Jews, you see, had multiplied and their numbers were threatening those who wielded power in all of Egypt. So finally the order came down that the Jews would have lives bitter with hard service. Curiously though, the more the Jews were oppressed, the more they multiplied, the more they spread abroad. The new Pharaoh, incessantly paranoid, so much so that he was willing to forego his cheap labor source in order to preserve his hold on power, said to his advisors, let us deal shrewdly with them. Enter the Hebrew midwives, the players poised to birth not only the children, but the future that God had promised. They were summoned by Pharaoh in order to end each new male life before breath could be drawn. When you act as midwives to the Hebrew women, says the scripture, and see them on the birth stool, if it's a boy, kill him, but if it's a girl, she shall live. By keeping the opposition's power down and numbers down, Pharaoh hoped to preserve his power, but he did not know Joseph, nor God, who reserved and preserved a remnant. To put it another way, Shipra and Pua knew that they were players in a drama that was bigger than they were. Moreover, they realized that Pharaoh was a few bricks shy of a pyramid. So these daughters of cunning decided to defy the order. They played their part as God's people and let many babies live, blaming their failure to commit murder on the vigorous constitution of the Hebrew women. In other words, they lied. They said that the Hebrew women gave birth before the midwives could even get to the birthing room. Not to be outwitted, Pharaoh just changed his tactic, proclaiming, every boy that is born to the Hebrews, you shall throw into the Nile. Now challenge someone to change the world and most of us back away. We don't think we can do it. We're fearful. We just don't feel up to the task. A new ruler takes the throne, a new president comes to power. A moment of truth or revelation or turning in life comes when we suddenly see things where our vision until then has failed us. It is though we've been covered all over by a beautiful shawl and a kitten down below has played with a shawl and snagged a piece of its string and in a moment pulled it all the way out. The unraveling happens in such moments as the announcement of a pandemic or like September 11th or when sexual abuse erupts in a church or the doctor says it's cancer or she says, I am leaving. It is as if the world suddenly quietly falls away from us, leaving us standing in the air alone. Everything that is firm becomes uncertain. Nothing seems like it will ever be the same again. Years ago in September 2011, our president said to us, adversity introduces us to ourselves. And he was right. And today we're discovering ourselves all over again with racial tension in the streets and a pandemic at our doors. When the unraveling happens in life, we may not immediately know who we are or what we're made of, but we suddenly discover in a new, dramatic, and sometimes very frightening way who we are not. When the foundations shake in our world, career, family, marriage, soul, there is that awful, even awesome need to redefine ourselves, an opportunity to realize that we are more rather than less. And so it was in the time of these two midwives who cared for their people. A new Pharaoh came to leadership who cared not a whit for God, nor for the Hebrew people. He wanted them dead. Had they a choice? Yes, of course. Faithful people always have a choice. Shipra and Pua chose well. As Pharaoh became more oppressive, they became more cunning. 
Shipra and Pua were no more willing to drown babies than they were going to kill them through other means. They simply became involved more and more in civil disobedience because they knew God and what God would have them do. One baby that we particularly remember was saved by their action and his family ironically took Pharaoh at his word and the world was forever changed. Again, hear the scripture. Now a man from the house of Levi went and took to wife a daughter of Levi. The story goes on. The woman conceived and bore a son. Under Pharaoh's sentence of death, this child was doomed to the waters of the Nile. But until, that is, his mother saw something of God in him, something good in his face. In an effort to keep the letter of the law, if not its intent, she prepared a papyrus basket and placed her child in the basket, hiding both among the reeds of the Nile, where by God's grace and poetic irony, that child was found, loved, and cared for until adulthood by none other than the Pharaoh's daughter. In Moses, the midwife's cunning was magnified by God's mighty hand. Now the rest of the tale we really know. Moses stuttered God's truth to Pharaoh's power, but power had then, and still does, have an ear seldom for the truth. So God spoke to God's powerful in Egypt in the language of power, and the firstborn of Egypt died. And then the lateborn of Egypt in fierce pursuit of God's people drowned in the Red Sea. The remnants of the Israelites were preserved and the people wandered in the wilderness. The Ten Commandments were given on stone tablets so that God's people would turn Godward in every moment of their lives. It's amazing, isn't it? It is amazing what happened long ago when two daughters of cunning, two faith-filled women, two Hebrew women who were slaves but who knew and loved God said no to Pharaoh's death plan and yes to God. They changed the world. And the ripples of their decisions which changed the world affected God's remnant and affects us today. How is God using you to change the world and improve it? There's a church in Johannesburg, South Africa, that took on a unique mission of rescuing children. After discovering the alarming rate of incidents of desperately poor migrant worker parents abandoning newborns in dumpsters, the church established what is called the Door of Hope. Cutting a hole through its high security wall, a regrettable necessity in the violent neighborhood in which the church is located, the church urged desperate new mothers to anonymously place their newborns inside the Door of Hope knowing that the church would indeed care for them. Since 2001, when Door of Hope was established, thousands of infants who otherwise would have died in the dumpsters have been saved. Evidence of daughters and sons of cunning yet among us. There is a book called The Butterfly Effect and its author catalogs the extraordinary impact of simple and courageous effects and efforts. Except when one looks back, one can never really tell whose efforts made the biggest difference. So for instance, should Norman Borlaw, who developed high yield disease resistant corn and wheat, be credited with saving over two million lives from famine? Or should Henry Wallace, the one term US vice president who created an office in New Mexico, to develop hybrid seed for arid climates and hired Borlaug to run it. Should Henry Wallace, maybe, be the one who we applaud for his life-saving efforts? Or should we credit George Washington Carver, who took a young Henry Wallace for long walks 
and instilled in him his love of plants. Maybe that's who we should applaud. Or should it be Moses and Susan Carver who adopted the orphaned George as their son? Or should it be, well, you get the idea, don't you? Andrews points out how interconnected our actions are in this world, creating an unforeseen butterfly effect that ripples across time and space to affect the lives of millions. Who knows? When you decide to change the world this week, the things you do, your actions, decisions, choices may ripple out with consequences foreseen and unforeseen, for good and for ill, for the health or damage of the world. You decide. The question isn't whether, it is but. What will you do to make a difference in the world this week? Some of your actions might be big and bold and dangerous and courageous. Others may be small, hardly noticeable, and yet, and yet they all have the potential to ripple out affecting countless lives. Do we have a Shipra or Pua out there among you? How many daughters or sons of cunning are there? Thanks be to God for another strange and wonderful Bible passage and story. Thanks be to God for Shipra and Pua. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. As we come to our prayer time today, we often offer to parents of, of children and youth a way to help develop prayer in their home. And today I'd like you to look at three balloons. You know, if you read the, the comics in the paper, you see balloons over the heads of somebody that tell us what they're thinking. Well, balloon prayers are a way of helping all of us to understand ways to approach God. There's no one right way. Maybe your balloon this week is thank you God for. Maybe another balloon that you might think of is sorry God for and you fill it in. Maybe it's, we can talk to God anytime, anywhere, about anything. And as you weed the plants or water the plants and cut back some of our, our growth, maybe you are just talking with God. That's a form of prayer. And finally, the one that we so often use, kind of a stop sign prayer, is we stop and say, oh God, please, please, please. Well, that's appropriate too. Please God, and you fill it in. As we come to our prayer time, remember that any of these are appropriate. It's a balloon prayer, sending up something to God. As we turn to our time of prayer, I invite you to remember those that have been alerted to you through our journey notes and on this recording, as well as on Sunday morning to think about those that are celebrating wonderful moments in their life, for life is still filled with joy, despite all that we're going through. Remember those who have asked to be placed on our prayer list. Some are grieving the loss of loved ones. Some are concerned about future. Some are facing medical crises. There is a whole host of things to be prayed for. And you've been given those names. I invite you to pray. And now would you pray with me? Gracious God, we gather like the psalmist declaring that we believe we have walked in integrity. We also believe that we have walked in faithfulness, avoided hypocrites and shunned the company of evildoers. We declare to you so many times all the good things that we remember doing and saying and believing every day. But just in case our level of integrity is not the same as yours, we, like the psalmist, say, prove us. Place your steadfast love before us again and again and again and again until we actually do walk in faithfulness to you. 
Allow us to sit in your presence until we soak up your character and reflect your glory to the world. Prove us. Try us. We pray, O oh Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Oh, I love to hear the song of creation, the wind and the rhythm of the rain. Oh, the thunder, it speaks of your power, but there's something in the sound of the saints. I've been washed in the roar of the ocean, found peace in the echoes of a cave and the trees of the field they clap their hands but there's something in the sound of the saints from the lips of those you save a redemption song will rise where the sound so full it breaks the sky Please keep the following people in your prayers this week. Pastor Chris, 
Brenda and Tom, Betty, Jan, Steve and Nancy, Bob and Gwen, Amanda, Michael, Nels, and Shelly and family. This week we celebrate with the following people. Happy birthday to Anna, Hunter, Judy, Tracy, Wayne, Shay and Karen, and happy anniversary to John and Lisa, and Nick and Maria. Today's announcements, we just have a couple announcements. Um, the office hours are going back to normal this week, Monday through Thursday, 10 to 2. And then, of course, as always, you can continue to mail in your offerings to the church or give online at, w, or at dlumc.org. Um, then, uh, just a reminder, because we're taping this ahead of time, if something comes up, please tune in to Journey Notes. Um, that will keep us updated for the week. And if you have any questions or concerns, feel free to give me a call or the church office. Have a good day. benediction. May the love of God surround you. May the love of God uplift you. May the love of God stand with you through trials and challenges. May the love of God convince you in every situation to love. Go now to love others even as God has loved you. <laughs>